most fascinating pieces that comes out of the Iana complex. It's known as the Warka vase. It's made out of limestone and dates to the late Uruk period. And it's actually uh, one of a, a probable pair of vases that uh, depicts a series of cultic scenes. Uh, and it probably was set up in the temple and used in a ritual fashion. You can see in this rollout drawing that it's a very complex and, uh, and a, a narrative, narrative story. This is actually one of our first pieces of, uh, of narrative art. And uh, it's broken into registers in which we see a, a very clear series of transitions. At the very bottom, you'll see these waves. And so we have a depiction of water, right? Probably either the Tigris or the Euphrates. And from water, we get the next stage in um, you know, sort of the food chain, so to speak, right? We have uh, wheat and barley, which then goes on to the next register in which we have rams and ewes. And it's important to note, actually, that, that it's not just, you know, sort of stylized sheep and goats at this point, right? We've got uh, male and female animals, uh, which, of course, you need both male and female animals to reproduce. So this is linked to fertility, to the, the you know, natural cycle in this bottom register. Next, right, comes uh, our, our human beings, these stylized uh, human beings, uh, naked uh, bald, carrying these oversized baskets of goods. And very similar to a cylinder seal, this goes all the way around. And these two registers or friezes, these first two bands, uh, are completely circular. And in a sense, uh, for that reason, infinite. Continue going around and around and around. I want to draw your attention to some of the depictions of these people. Um, note the spacing at this time. There's no overlap whatsoever between these figures. And the style that's being used is a, is a composite of both frontal and profile views. For example, in the head here, you can see that, yes, this is a profile view, but the eye that's being depicted on the head is actually a frontal eye. It's a full eye. Um, so really what this is is a, a form of conceptual art. Uh, the artist is communicating the human form, uh, avoiding any of the, you know, sort of overlaps and contradictions that would, would possibly uh, not let you see what, is, what he's trying to represent. The stance is open, so you see both legs, both arms, uh, the eye, the nose, uh, all the characteristic parts. So it's very clear that this is a human being, but it's not a naturalistic depiction of a human being. It's a conceptual depiction of a human being. That said, uh, these registers are much more orderly than the earlier forms of art that we saw. There are ground lines employed, right? A sense of gravity. These figures aren't just floating in space like we saw at Ketal Hayuk. Instead, now they're anchored on a firm ground line. So that's a, 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 a very important development that sets the stage for, um, for years to come. At the, at the top, in this upper scene, we have a number of very interesting things taking place. Unlike the two lower scenes, which are cylindrical and continuous, this one has a clear break, has a clear point of confrontation in which a series of these you know, offers are coming forward and meeting right here. And this is one of our first images of a presentation scene, a presentation of offerings, votive offerings being brought before a divinity. And most probably this divinity, right, again, there are our, our reed columns, that symbol uh, which is uh, uh, symbolizing Inanna. And this might be Inanna herself. Unfortunately, there was a, a bit missing. We'd be able to tell if it was Inanna by her headdress, if she had these horns of, um, of divinity, which we'll see later. Uh, we'd know she was a goddess. Unfortunately, we don't have them. Uh, so she might also be a priestess of Inanna receiving these offerings. There's another figure here as well. Uh, you can't see him very well. Uh, he's being led and uh, back tassel of his elaborate wardrobe is being held by this uh, servant. But this is probably uh, a priest or a king. Again, our N figure. And um, the N sign is actually here. It's being held by uh, this little guy who's on the back of a on the back of a, of a sheep. And so, so what we see is um, 
possibly, like we talked about last time, you know, with Inanna and the distribution of those maze, the attributes of, the, of civilization, the Warkavis in many ways is almost an exchange taking place. Some have called it a sacred marriage between the ruler and uh, Inanna, right, the secular and the divine. Uh, the exchange of all these offerings and tribute for these attributes of civilization. And right there, there's the May sign, or I'm sorry, the end sign, the sign of kingship uh, that's being given over to this individual. And we don't have him, we don't see him. Um, but, but we do know he's there by way of his foot um, and uh, his tassel. Um, a few other things to note. Just like in those cylinder seals, I asked you to remember those two vases. Right, that showed up in the early Uruk cylinder seals. We see the same thing here, these two vases. And in many ways, right, just like that early Picrolite figurine we saw way back in Cyprus, that figurine that you would wear, and the figurine itself was wearing an image of itself. This is another example of self-referential art. This is the Uruk vase referencing itself and its own position in you know, being used as a, as a, ritual, uh, a ritual object. So uh, almost a, a mini um, instruction guide included in the piece itself. So you can see this is radically different than anything we've seen so far. Uh, a very important shift and a very, very interesting piece uh, for, uh, for a number of reasons. Any questions about, about this before we kind of move on? We'll be coming back to some of these, uh, these motifs. Here's a close-up of some of these pieces. You can see, again, uh, the skill it would take to carve these. This uh, N figure, right, that, uh, that we see, again, the N sign right here. We see the N figure in a variety of different situations. And N, again, roughly translates to you know, priest king, this representation of secular and religious authority. And he's always depicted the same way. He always has a beard, this rolled headdress, long hair coming out of the back. We see him in a variety of, of cultic scenarios, uh, scenarios involving uh, battle. Um, here you can see him, you know, uh, essentially dispatching a number of enemies, uh, and then also hunting scenes as well. Uh, these we see in these late Uruk cylinder seals. Again, right, we'll go back to this one. You can see all these attributes over and over. There's the, uh, the uh, Inanna, pillars again. You start seeing these again and again. Not just in cylinder seals too. We also see them in relief carving. Uh, this is actually a, a very important piece. It's known as the lion hunt stele, also from the late Uruk period. And in it you can see this N figure, immediately identifiable by his headdress. He's dispatching lions. He's killing lions in two different ways. One with a, a spear and in this case with a, uh, a bow and arrow. Lion hunting, and specifically lion hunting being done by the king, is a motif we're going to see over and over and over again as well. This is the first. Again, these are all firsts. Uruk is all about firsts. And you'll, you know, later on, uh, several lessons, you know, several lectures from now, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, this is almost exactly like what I saw before. Um, the hunting of lions, um, the, the establishment of order, right, those maze, our civilization, the establishment of order over chaos uh, is, is the job of a king. And it's most supremely represented in the destruction of, uh, of, of these wild animals that used to roam the plains of Syria and Mesopotamia at this time. Lions were a real nuisance, a real problem. So dispatching them was, uh, was certainly something that uh, you know, uh, was necessary. We think today it's kind of brutal and awful. And in fact, when we get to Neo-Assyria, you'll see you know, these lions are dying in all these agonizing, horrible ways. But you know, for Mesopotamians, um, this was a real issue. You know, you're walking out in the plains and uh, you could get attacked. A very different world. Uh, we see relief in the round. I love this picture. I would have loved to find something like this. You could see this end figure being found. He's you know, sort of protected almost like a little time traveler in his little uh, vessel here. Uh, but this is a, a very small figure. He's only about seven inches tall. But again, you know, our end figure uh, with his beard and his rolled cap, those eyes staring forward, the emphasis on those, those very dark eyes, something that we've seen as early as Ayn Ghazal and we'll continue to see. Um, uh, so uh, 
again, the N is, is very important. A few, other, um, a few other motifs that emerged during the Uruk period. We've talked about the N figure. We've talked about the master of the animals motif, all those attributes of Inanna. We also see this um, sort of wild man figure. He's known as the nude belted hero. He is naked, but he's wearing a belt. And he's depicted in all sorts of ways. We see him in cylinder seals, uh, many times in later cylinder seals. This is an Akkadian cylinder seal. But here he is um, in that master of the animals pose. Uh, these uh, stone cult vessels from Jemet Nasser depict him uh, in the same position, right? Only in 3D, he's between two bowls, the same, um, uh, the same sort of uh, very balanced, symmetrical image in this case. Uh, he's very kind of characteristic, you know, those of you who have, who have, have now read uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, this Enkidu figure, the Enkidu, the, 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 the friend of Gilgamesh, this wild man who comes out of, the, uh, out of the wilderness and is sort of brought to civilization and then ends up dying. Uh, this nude belted hero is very similar. And it's thought by many to, to kind of represent this Enkidu figure, but it's not, not entirely clear who he is. See again um, some of these other cult vessels also coming from Uruk. The same sense of symmetry, um, flanking lions on both sides. Uh, we'll see flanking lions. We saw this as early as right uh, figures at Katalhuk, those mother goddess figures with two lions on both sides. Um, another manifestation of that. That's another motif we'll see over and over again. Third and uh, final one we'll see, at least for today, uh, are these attack scenes. Um, lions attacking bulls, attacking gazelles. This is another very popular motif in Mesopotamian iconography that finds its origins in Uruk. So, uh, so another one to keep your eyes open for as we, as we move on. Um, finally, one of the most beautiful and evocative examples of art coming from the Iana complex. And again, these objects were found in a pit. They were found in a ritually uh, disposed pit. Um, when these temples were being torn down and the objects inside them were being reused, they had to be disposed of properly. These were objects that had a lot of significance. And so you couldn't just throw them away. You had to probably bury them with an association of rituals to desacralize them. This, uh, this mask of a woman or a goddess is from a rook. It's also known as the warka head. It be the warka vase and the warka head. And um, it's life size. It's made out of marble. I'm sorry, uh, it's not marble, but it's, it's limestone as well. Um, and in use, it would have been very, very different than what we see. Uh, those of you who you know, have studied uh, Greek and Roman art, you'll know that uh, the, the statues that we, we look at, these white, you know, clean white statues, uh, were often painted. Uh, it's the same.